<laughs> have there been some pretty uh, ridiculous things said? Yes, there have been. Uh, and the one thing I would say about anyone doing the exam is whatever you say, make sure it's safe. Because where we really, where people fail is when they say the most ridiculous thing, which is completely unsafe, right? And then you start questioning, is this a person who is under pressure and has said this? Or is this a person who is desperately unsafe that we don't want ever near a patient, or at least not certifying that they should be nearing a patient? And that's the key thing. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We're in the month of July and the theme for the month is Rhinoplasty for Residents and it's proudly brought to us by Medtronic. I don't even have to say who Medtronic are. We all know about Medtronic and how great they are, so shout out to them for enabling this podcast. So I've specifically chosen um, the guests on this month for people who have a gift of teaching. Gift of teaching uh, yeah, residents and people around that. So we, today, our guest of honor is no one other than all the way from London, the UK, is Sandeep Porn. Sandeep, thank you so much for being on the show today. Pleasure to be with you, Cameron, as always. It's, I'm looking forward to, I, I've never, I've never done a podcast, so let's, let's, uh, let's enjoy this. <laughs> we look forward to chatting to you about all sorts of things. So sure. tell, tell the listeners, how did you get into rhinoplasty? It's, good, it's a good question. I think we are influenced by the people who you work with um, initially in your career. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen that a lot. I mean, it's, people don't tend to change, you know, tact in careers later on in life. It's, it's who you influence early. And I was very lucky as, as a registrar or a resident uh, very early to, to come across some uh, excellent rhinoplasty surgeons, including the legendary Tony Bull, who I worked for both as a very junior, uh, what we call senior house officer, which is like a, a pre-registrar, pre-resident, uh, and then as a registrar as well. So he, he obviously influenced things. I was, uh, I had some other excellent people along my way who who uh, um, also influenced me and I think that's the key to it I mean if you're going to go into this you you need to go and spend time with people who you uh, hopefully uh, trust and uh, respect and gain a lot from and I did and then once you're in that then it becomes an easy pathway because you love what you do and then after that, I went and so after my residence, residency, I went and did a, a facial plastics fellowship uh, and again, spent some time with some very inspirational people, people who have stayed with me throughout my life. And that's the other key is, you know, get mentors and hopefully learn from mentors over the years. So my mentors were Gilbert Nostrinite, who I spent um, uh, six months with in, in Amsterdam and then with Peter Adamson in Toronto. And um Again, these guys have been hugely influential both in my career and, of course, facial plastic surgery worldwide. Uh, and to this day, I still call friends and we talk, um, you know, very, very often, um, including discussing the odd case still, even after all these years. So I know you, I still remember to the day going up a lift in Dallas at the American meeting and I knew who you were, but I introduced myself and I asked you about sitting these facial plastic surgery board exams and it has ignited a spark, you know, and uh, I'm forever grateful for having been able to do that. Uh, the question that I've got for you is you, you're, you work in private practice in London. Okay. But why did you do so much in education over the years? What was your motivation behind that on the one hand? And then the second question is how did you get the balance right between the enormous effort you've put, put in internationally and, and setting up exams and, and being an examiner and stuff and your private practice. So maybe the first question then is, why did you do this? So um, I'm not just in private practice. I do have a, a, a university appointment in our, in our national health system, albeit I'm very part-time there now. So I started off as uh, within the national health system, as most people do in, in, in the UK, and then uh, as I got busier and busier privately and, and for a variety of reasons, I dropped some of my national health commitments. So um, and then my private practice obviously became the, the, the biggest part of my life. 
Um, I've always enjoyed education. I've always enjoyed teaching. And I think that the, the thing with teaching and, and, and being an educator is that you can be an excellent surgeon, but then not be able to teach. And I've seen that. I've seen it in uh, in meetings where there's live operating and the surgeon is so focused on what he's doing um, and yet not being able to impart that knowledge. Um, and so it's not that they're a terrible surgeon. In fact, quite the opposite. There, there are some remarkable surgeons but who just can't impart the knowledge. And fortunately, I think I can, I've been blessed being able to talk through things whilst I'm operating, and that takes a certain desire and skill. And it is a desire because, as you know, Cameron, I'm sure you've been teaching residents uh, along the way now as well, um, you know, it takes patience. I was actually operating yesterday uh, in our university hospital and, you know, taking my resident through a, a rhinoplasty and getting him to open the nose and you know you know you can do it in five minutes and he's going to take 25 minutes and it's 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 having that patience uh, to be able to do that so first of all I, I enjoyed teaching and, and part of the reasons why I think I remain within the university is really because of my teaching commitments I mean I really quite enjoy that um, in terms of you know the board exam and, and, and setting all of that up. So I, I was one of the first people, if not the first person in, in Europe, um, who, who I, I wasn't quite the first person, I think there were, there were a couple of people. I was certainly first person certified in Europe, but I took the exam, I think, in the second year that it, we were offered it um, to do the board exam. And partly because I was doing a fellowship, I really was interested in facial plastic, the broad area of facial plastic. I know we're talking mainly about rhinoplasty, but the whole broad area of facial plastic surgery and certainly to those residents and fellows out there, if you want to expand your your knowledge and your um, your ability to do operations outside of just rhinoplasty, then doing the board exam is it, it, it just opens your eyes as to all the other things which are out there. And I'm not just talking about cosmetic work. I'm talking about reconstructive work. I'm talking about you know congenital issues, all the other things you may be interested in doing. And no matter what specialty you are, whether you're plastics, whether you're uh, ENT, and in some and in in, in some areas even facial uh, uh, maxillofacials, although that's a little bit more difficult because they have slightly varied training internationally. Um, but no matter what specialty you are, you know it, it's it's a it, 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 broadening your knowledge is, is always a good thing. So when I did my exam right at the beginning, I was so inspired by it. I mean, it was the best exam that I'd ever done in the sense that, you know, it, it, the way it was structured and Cameron, I, I, you've been through it, you will know how well structured that exam is. It, it's, it's enormously, it, it's, it's normally enormously validated. We spent, you know, years trying to get that uh, exam as, as good as we can. I think it's, it's in a pretty good place. Um, and we we sort of piggyback onto the American uh, exam and, you know, they've been doing this a long time. So we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're using that American exam to get, we where, get where we want to be. And in terms of, you know, progressing with that, so right from the beginning, I was so enthused about it. I started writing about it and trying to encourage other people to do it. And it, it, it took off slowly. It took off slowly. And, we, you know, every year we used to get three, maybe four people doing it from Europe um, but at that time, we used to have to go to the US to do it. And that was a major struggle in itself because you're, you're going, you know, across, across the pond, you're, you're jet lagged, you're, you know, all the other things. And it's hard enough exam as it is. And, and so then uh, about eight years ago, we made the decision that we wanted to have it in Europe. And now there were political reasons for that as well, for, for validity, for uh, recognition within Europe. Um, but we, we moved the exam to Europe, again, piggybacking onto the American uh, exam. Um, and I think that's been revolutionary because since then, uh, it's really taken off. I mean, we, we now have regularly have 10 plus candidates a year. I think at the most we had 16 candidates every year and it's been amazing. And of course, the ability for uh, Europeans at least to come across without that trek, uh, a trek across the, the pond, it has been revolutionary for them. Um, it makes life much easier. It's the same exam, it's the same quality, and, and everything else is the same. It's just you don't have to do the travel. Okay, so uh, half a step back here. We've got listeners from all around the world. Maybe you want to explain to them what exactly is facial plastic surgery and why should they consider sitting an exam like this? So the, the facial plastic surgery um, remit uh, um, really started, I guess, within the otolaryngology, head and neck field, um, and really being able to do 
uh, reconstructive and, and of course, uh, uh, aesthetic cosmetic uh, um, procedures within the field of just the face and head and neck region. Um, and the importance of that is uh, we've all become super specialized in what we do. Um, and, you know, I, I think the... I guess it will be country dependent, but certainly in, in Europe, um, most people are now picking, they may well be general, you know, otolaryngologists or, or plastic surgeons or whatever, but even within whatever specialty you are, you're beginning to focus in one area. So I don't think, as I say, it matters what specialty you come from, but it's the specialization in what you do and the focus in what you do, which is critical. And I think we all realize that you can be a jack of all trades, but never be great at doing any of them. And what we want to do is, is, is become specialized in, in, in that field. So I think that's how facial plastic surgery, obviously, a, a, as an entity took off. And it really just comprises everything to do around the face and neck region. So, for example, in the board exam, we cover everything from reconstructive, um, you know, congenital trauma, and cosmetic. I mean, the, and it's a broad spectrum exam covering all of the above. So one of the things we've had over the years is people have been a little bit sort of concerned that, um, you know, or, or, or have gone into that exam thinking, oh, I'm only going to be asked about rhinoplasty or, or, or cosmetic facial work. That's just not true. It really does cover everything. Um, and as, and so that's what facial plastic surgery is. And, and you know, bringing an exam to it just helps focus the mind and, of course, gives the person taking the exam enormous credence and, and enormous satisfaction, personal satisfaction, uh, having been able to pass this. And in, in the broader sense... So, okay. Uh, carry on. Yeah. Okay, so the exam is very difficult. I mean, I remember the first day, it's two, three-hour written papers, and the next day is the orals. And basically, they're kind of two groups. There's the, the youngsters who've just finished their fellowship, and they sit this exam. And then you've got the older dogs who've been out in, in the workplace for a few years, and then they want to sit the exam. I would love to know from an examiner's point of view, you must have some hilarious stories about the orals and and things that people can come up with when they're under pressure. Um, because like the guys who haven't been studying for a long time, they've been out of it. It's, it's a different ball game to them than a fellow who's doing ward rounds every day and getting pampered and asked about papers, et cetera, like that. But tell us a little bit about some of your amusing stories, if you have any. <laughs> yeah, we have to be careful here who, 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 what we say. I, I have to say, it's actually the, the guys who come out. Uh, who, so, the, as, as you say, there are two ways of doing it. You can either be a fellow, uh, an official fellow, and at the end of your fellowship, go on and do the exam. <clears throat> and then that doesn't get you uh, certification. All that gives you is is you pass effectively passed one part of that certification process, and then you have to produce cases afterwards over two years. Or you can do it the other way around, as you said, and you get some of the older guys who have been in practice for a while, then going into it. What we find is actually it's the opposite. The, 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 the guys who have been in practice, more often than not, find the, the orals relatively straightforward. And certainly within their remit of practice, it's pretty straightforward because the orals are never there to catch you out. They're never really there to kind of... You know, which is very different, I have to say, from the British exams when, you know, it really depends on who's examining you, what they had for lunch, whether they had a glass, glass of wine and whether they're feeling a bit sleepy. And, you know, you could get asked about anything and then they can, you know, it's well known that once you dig your hole, they let you dig it a bit further and then they let you dig it a bit further still until you can't get out. And, and we're completely the opposite in, in the board exam for facial plastic. We, we never let you dig your hole. If you dig a hole, we pull you out of it and we move on. And, and that's the key. So most actual experienced guys do pretty well in the orals because it's about everyday practice, as you say. And, and what we tend to find is with the experienced guys have got less, you know, book knowledge, as it were. So the, the fellows have been studying all year and, and, and read the books. But yet you ask them, you know, give me five ways of, I don't know, deprojecting a nose. And, and they just won't, well, or they might know the book uh, options, but then you say to them, well, which one would you use? And they haven't got a clue because they've not done it or, or they've done very little of it. And, and, and that's the key. 
But have there been some howlers? Yes, of course there have. I mean, everyone under pressure, uh, you know, it comes up with stuff. But I think as an examiner, and I've been doing this a long time now, I always think back to when I did my exam, God knows how many years ago now, 17, 18 years ago, and how I felt. And, you know, the ridiculous things I remember I said in my board exam. So when, when we do get the odd sort of complete madness, you might have a personal chuckle and the important thing is you don't chuckle and you don't chuckle at them because that that would be terrible but you you might have a personal you might have a personal chuckle to yourself and then afterwards you might sort of you know go to one of your examiners and say gosh you you never mentioned who it was but god i had this terrible thing you might mention it but but whatever stay whatever happens in that room stays in that room as far as i'm concerned because we've we've all been there and, and as you know under pressure we we say the most ridiculous things yeah okay cool so but yes the ha, 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 have, there, have there been some pretty ridiculous things said yes there have been and, and the one thing i would say about anyone doing the exam is whatever you say make sure it's safe because where we really where people fail is when they say the most ridiculous thing, which is completely unsafe, right? And then you start questioning, is this a person who is under pressure and has said this? Or is this a person who is desperately unsafe that we don't want ever near a patient, or at least not certifying that they should be nearing a patient? And that's the key thing. Okay, so thanks for all of that. Now, uh, let's try to tack, track a bit here. Um, we were off air, we were speaking, you said how exceptionally busy last year was for you. And that's like in the middle of COVID. How, what, what happened? How come you were so busy last year? I think, and I don't think it was me, it, was, it wasn't just me, I think across the board. And it would be, be very interesting to see. Um, I, I haven't yet been to an international meeting uh, other than uh, virtually. So I haven't sat down with, with other people across the planet. But um, certainly in the UK, and I suspect speaking to a lot of my, just speaking to other international colleagues, um, there was a bounce back. And I, I, I see that bounce back in, uh, in terms of people wanting, uh, certainly cosmetic work, being fivefold. Uh, and I wrote an article about this uh, not so long ago. I think it was a combination of factors. First of all, there was, of course, this latent demand because, you, you know, like everyone else, between about March and July of 2020, you know, we were shut effectively during that first lockdown. Um, I, we weren't doing anything uh, other than sort of emergency work and no elective work was being done. And so there's obviously a, a natural demand that comes from that. But I didn't just see that natural demand coming through. I saw a massive bounce in the practice. I mean, to, to, as I say, to one point, we were probably three to four times as busy as we were pre-COVID. Um, so I think there was a natural bounce. I think the other thing which had happened was people had been reflecting during that first lockdown on what was important to them, why they wanted to do, uh, uh, what, they, what, what was important in their lives. And people who had been thinking about cosmetic surgery uh, had suddenly decided, well, maybe now's the right time to do it. And there were many other factors involved in that decision making in the sense that there was no social life, so they could hide away. Uh, there was no, uh, there were no weddings or big things going on. So not, not only were they hiding away, but there weren't the costs involved. So if they were going to get married or, or you know, they were going to, uh, um, you know, go out to eat every week, as, as we all do, go to restaurants, suddenly all that money was there. Um, so financially, it became it became an easier call, and of course, the big financial thing was people weren't going away on holidays. So your how much money you would normally spend on a vacation abroad that year, or two vacations abroad year, weren't, weren't happening, and weren't foreseeably going to happen. And again, people therefore had a little bit more money in their pocket to be able to expendable income went across. And this wasn't just in cosmetic work. If you look at, and I've been reading quite a lot of reports about consumerism generally. Um, for example, I, I love watches and the watch market has gone insane, absolutely insane. And you think in the middle of a pandemic when people are, you know, are, are struggling, uh, you know, suddenly watch prices have tripled or quadrupled in some cases um, over the last year or so. I mean, it, it's mad. And, and, and that's kind of consumerism went up. And I think as part of that, people wanting surgery went up. And then there was the inevitable, what I call the Zoom effect, um, people spending time looking at themselves on Zoom. And of course, 
as you well know, selfies and Zoom cameras, the webcams kind of distort things as well. Uh, and, you know, they suddenly start looking at themselves constantly in the mirror and thinking, or constantly in Zoom and thinking, gosh, I really wanted, I've always wanted my nose fixed. And then, of course, they had the time on their hands and, and not being away from work, which was, I think, the, 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 the other big reason is because not only could they hide away from other people, but they wouldn't necessarily have to take time off because they could continue working from home. Because So I think there was, it was just a, a the perfect storm that happened. Um, what we've found in my practice is having been through, I mean, crazy times last year where we were, really were insanely busy, um, it's it's calmed down again now. And, and I think the reason for that is people are going back to work. Holidays are back on the cards. And of course, social lives are back. So as we ru- go back to normality, I think my practice has returned to some, I mean, we're still busier than we were pre-COVID, but and certainly nowhere as busy as we were, say, six to eight months ago. That's fascinating. Now tell me, what do you do for time off? Yeah, so the last year there hasn't been, as I was saying to you uh, beforehand, I, I need the time off. I mean, I've always enjoyed traveling. I mean, that's been part of you know what we what we do, and and it's it's always been great uh, to go to meetings and see people and and that thing. But I think one of the things the pandemic has has kind of focused my mind on is that, is that sometimes we travel for the sake of traveling. You know, we go to meetings for the sake of going to meetings. And I'm sure you've been there and I've certainly been there. And in many, even even when I came to Durban with uh, a few, you know, two or three years ago um, uh, with Saucer, you know, I, I just didn't see enough of the country. I mean, I was literally, time-wise, I was flying in and I was flying out. Yes, yes we spent some a, a good amount of quality time together, which we don't often do. But I've, I've, come, to, I've come to a point in time where, I, you know, I've, we, there's so much content now on the internet uh, or, or through webcams or through webinars or podcasts, etc., that you don't necessarily need to be traveling halfway around the world to go and listen to that person. Or, and of course, there's the social aspects of that going on. But I don't think we need to spend so much time. And, and so webinars and stuff, have, 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 and I've really now come to a point where I want to go to places where I want to go to. I'm sorry not to have been able to, uh, to come to um, South Africa this year. It would have been nice to have done so. But, you know, it, it, for a variety of reasons, I couldn't do that. Um, but, yes, it, I mean, other things. So I love travel. Um, and I think that's the when I get downtime, I kind of don't want to be in the UK. So if I get a week off, I just want to. I just want to be away somewhere. And of course, we've just not been able to do that. So uh, the, the one good thing has been is I've seen a lot more of the UK in the last year than I've ever seen before. You know, I, I just don't, I, I, can't, I see London as a bubble. And when I leave that London bubble, it's almost like I run out of breath thinking, oh my God, where am I? And, the, and, and you know, I, I am one of these people who, do, who who is very London centric. So seeing part of different parts of uh, the UK as I've had to do over the last year because I'm not going away. But I think, I think that bubble has burst now and I really do want to be out, outside of the UK again and traveling. So I, I really enjoy that. Okay. So tell me, linked to this traveling is kind of almost humanitarian work that you do and teaching you've done. A lot of that has been in, um, in East Africa and in India and in the Middle East. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So, um, yeah, East Africa just came about. Um, I was born, as you know, in East Africa. I was born in Tanzania. And so I've actually done some volunteer work in Tanzania before. And then I've taught in, in um, Kenya. So Kenya have a very uh, active uh, ENT society who, who really don't have much um, experience or or, uh, uh, or certainly um, there aren't too many people doing facial plastic work so I wouldn't say I've been evangelical but I've certainly tried to spread the word there in terms of doing facial plastic work uh, and the Kenyan society have been very receptive to that so I've been out to Nairobi a couple of times and taught out there. Uh, the stuff in India which I did really again um, I'm of Indian origin uh, but don't really have any roots in India per se but I was invited to some meetings out there and uh, and most recently, we've been running sort of fellowship programs out there for for Indian surgeons. What what I tend to find in India is that there are some exceptionally talented surgeons, like anywhere else in the world, there. But their their willingness and ability to teach is, is perhaps a little bit more limited. And again, I think as 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 we become more global, um, you know, 
a lot of the Indian surgeons are being able to access webinars and, and all the other things. But it's the one-to-one teaching which I think they sometimes miss out on or their professor doesn't always allow them to do all those cases. So uh, I have a very good colleague of mine in, in Jaipur who, who set up this fellowship program and asked me to come, you know, on a yearly basis, which I was obviously prior to COVID. I haven't been for the last two and a half years or so. Um, and, and that's very satisfying from my point of view because we get young sometimes not so young surgeons. I think the oldest guy we had, there was 60 something who, who decided to come along for a, a one week. I mean, yeah, I mean, for a one week, but you know, they're, they're, they're so keen to learn and uh, we do about 12 to 15 cases in a week there. Uh, it's hands on for them. Um, so they can be hands on with me. Um, and when you're, sometimes when you go to courses and meetings and stuff, you see exceptionally good surgeons, but they t- you'll, you'll hear five different ways of, of doing the same thing. Um, whereas if you've got the same person doing the same thing and you, you, you're seeing them 14, 15 cases in a row, it really consolidates things. And as I say, I, I think having that ability to be able to impart knowledge is important. So that's where I've done that. And, and in the Middle East, again, um, it, it started really with um, the their governments, uh, the various governments actually asking me to go and help with the difficult cases. But then it became uh, a case of just going there and teaching their surgeons. And that's been very gratifying again, because uh, when I've been back and seeing some of the surgeons actually employing techniques which they'd never seen before, or even, you know, a lot of them hadn't even done a rhinoplasty before, and now that some of these guys are excellent. So, yeah, it, it, it is, it's, it's been fun. It's been a journey, um, and I've really enjoyed it. And, and, yeah, teaching has been a huge part of my life, for sure. Okay. And then in terms of actually getting teaching in London, like, so if some of the listeners wanted to come and visit you, is that a possibility? Of course, yeah. I mean, so we, I, I get regular um, visitors all the time. So um, in, during the COVID period, when, when we were exceptionally busy, we had a lot of my ex-residents who have now moved on to other places. And, and of course, one of the problems that happened internationally, I'm sure, but certainly happened in the UK, was the residents or registrars in, in the UK just weren't getting operating to do because all electing operating was essentially off the table and not just for the first lockdown and certainly in various uh, hospitals and particularly our hospital where we were kind of almost like one of the biggest COVID centres for London um, you know elective operating didn't really start for nine months six nine months so there was very little going on for these guys but fortunately in the private sector we were allowed to operate um, even though there were some restrictions going on and a lot of the elective operating, cancer operating and stuff was being moved to the private sector. So we had more limited space um, to do these cases. Um, but we had a lot of residents uh, and and uh, I had a couple of fellows who came along as well uh, to the private sector. But yes, anyone who ever wants to come, they're very, very welcome to London and they just need to get in contact. And, and certainly for short observerships, it's not a problem, whatever. Uh, we are. T- I am taking fellows. One of the problems we have with our f- uh, it, with fellows is I don't have a paid fellowship, and and therefore it, London being London is is you know pretty expensive for people. But we've had we've had fellows who've come for three to six months uh, at a time in the past, um, and certainly again it helped. We've had fellows from the Middle East because it helps there because they often can come with uh, funding from their own government, so that makes a difference too. Okay, so my last question, um, the focus is obviously rhinoplasty for residents this month. For the residents who are listening to this podcast, in your mind, what are the things you really need to learn how to nail if you want to be a successful rhinoplasty surgeon? I think the thing you've really got to nail is what you're ultimately trying to achieve. I think that sometimes gets lost in techniques and whether you're going to do preservation or structural and whether you're going to do, you know, I I don't know, a lateral crural steel or or a septal extension graft. There are so many different techniques. I think the first thing for a resident is trying to work out what looks good on a patient, the surface anatomy. Where is your final result going to be? Because 
I've been there and talked, you know, and, and asked, discuss things with a resident and say, well, what would you do with this notice? And they would say, oh, I do this, this and this. And I say, yeah, but what, why are you doing these things? What are you actually trying to achieve for this patient? So I think getting the, the most important thing is nailing what it is you're hoping to achieve for this patient. What is a good rhinoplasty result? Go away, look at meetings and say, what do you constitute as being an excellent rhinoplasty result for your patient? And we all have different patient groups. In South Africa, you may well see a different, you know, different type of patient skin type and uh, et cetera to, to Europe. And London being cosmopolitan, we have all skin types. So what looks good on a Caucasian patient may not look good on an Afro-Caribbean patient, may not look so good on, a, on an Asian patient, et cetera. So making sure that that's the key thing. And then working backwards, then working backwards. So... As a young resident, I would say go away and, and, and look at the nose, look at what you're trying to achieve, and then work backwards from there, saying, I want to get, for this particular patient, I'm looking to get some projection. I'm trying to, okay, remove a bit of the hump. I'm trying to get some rotation. What's going to look, what's going to look there? And then say, okay, what are my, now my options for removing that bump? Is it going to be preferable for me to do a preservation as opposed to a structural why am I doing each of these things? And that often gets lost. I mean, I, we, we all teach, we all go and see people, we all go and see these various speakers. And sometimes a lot of it just gets lost on and not actually understanding what, we're, what, what, the, what the, the last, um, uh, what the end goal has got to be in all sure. of this. Sandeep, you know, I find it so inspiring talking to you. You're a real gentleman, eh? You, you've like... In Afrikaans, we have a saying that says, still a water deep grond. It's like quiet waters, but they're deep, you know? And to be able to take half an hour of your time and just listen has been fantastic. So from my side, I mean, it's, I've got so much respect for you. I think what you do is amazing. But for, on behalf of all the listeners around the world, thank you very much for um, being on the show today. Thank you, Cameron. It's always a pleasure. And, uh, You've done amazing things for facial plastic surgery. You've really, uh, you know, changed the way we look at, um, uh, you know, the webinars that you did there when, when COVID first came along. I mean, it's, it's kind of spawned a whole new generation uh, of how we look at um, uh, uh, content, educational content. And, you know, long may it continue and well done for everything you, you do. Because I know you have a busy practice. You've got a brand new hospital and, how you find the time to do all of this, I, I don't know. And so having asked me, where, where do I spend my spare time? I, I often ask you, do you have any spare time at all? I've got lots of all? spare time. I get out, get away from everything, go into the bushes. <laughs> yeah, guys, also a big shout out to yeah, Medtronic absolutely. for enabling this month. Um, rhinoplasty for residents. It's, yeah, make sure you buy good equipment. Don't um, sell yourself short on poor equipment. So come back again next week for another scintillating interview. And thank you for all the listeners for supporting the podcast.